Hey guys, this is Matt from Amateur Filmies and welcome to a brand new video where I'll be going through all the Blu-rays that we picked up during the Indicator sale that just happened not long ago. Being that we live in Australia, obviously shipping is always very costly to us, but Indicator have a thing where if you spend over 200 pounds, you get free international shipping. So Sarah and I didn't have much choice. So given that and the fact that Sarah and I have been wanting to pick up a lot of these titles for quite some time, uh, there's a lot to show. So sit back and enjoy. So this is a very expensive time of year, as most of you know, of course, uh, Black Friday just happened. So a lot of these Blu-ray companies tend to put on really big sales. So we've got stuff from Indicator that we're going to show in this video, but we also made an order with Vinegar Syndrome and Arrow as well. So they'll be coming in future videos. But obviously, you know, with the amount of titles that we've gotten in, in this short time frame, it's hard to watch them all in preparation for a video. I've watched a decent chunk of these and I'll be able to give you my thoughts on them as we go through them. But please bear in mind that a decent amount of these are still yet to be watched because they've literally arrived not that long ago. So for those of you who collect Blu-rays from Indicator, you'll know that their first print run of titles is always in a limited edition format. And once they sell out of those limited editions, they re-release the, um, the movie in like a standard edition. And so we'll go through the standard editions that we picked up first. So the first standard edition we have is The China Syndrome. This was actually the first Blu-ray out of all the ones I'm going to show that I watched first because I'd been anticipating it for quite some time. So this film came out in 1979 and stars Jack Lemmon, Jane Fonda, and Michael Douglas. And I have to say straight off the bat that Jack Lemmon's performance in this is just brilliant. I really found him to be a really compelling character. And I don't know if he did or not, but he definitely should have been um, nominated for an Oscar for his role in this. So in this film, Jane Fonda and Michael Douglas work for a news station and they get asked to do a piece on the nuclear power plant. And basically when they go there, um, their job is just to do sort of like a walk through the entire factory to report on like the daily going ons of the whole place. But when they're there, something actually goes wrong and they secretly film the event. And basically the rest of the movie is them trying to sort of unpack how catastrophic this problem could have been if it were not prevented. And I really like these sort of journalist type movies where, you know, there's a lot of information being conveyed and just sort of seeing a really big story slowly unfold. I really like this. Maybe like a modern comparison could be like Spotlight. Obviously the focus is very different in Spotlight, but I really like that sort of uncovering of information over the course of the film. I really found it quite compelling. So the film came out in the 70s, which means that obviously nuclear power and, you know, the idea of using nuclear power as a main source of energy was a very topical thing at the time. So it was cool to also to see how the film portrayed, like, different types of attitudes towards the, the use of nuclear power at a time when it was obviously very prominent in the social discussions and stuff. Obviously, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I have to give credit to the ending of this movie. I think the last 10 or 15 minutes or so... It was extremely tense and it actually gave me a lot of anxiety. Just, yeah, it's such a really, really great film in my opinion. I do highly recommend it, not just for the um, acting performances, which I've already praised, but there's a lot of tension in the film, as I've just mentioned. And yeah, just a really interesting topic in my opinion as well. So next up is the film See No Evil. This one is obviously still sealed, so I haven't watched this one yet, but what drew me to it in the first place was that it was a horror title that Indicator had put out, and they have put out a decent amount of horror titles, but for the most part, their catalogue is pretty, you know, pretty diverse, so I wanted to check out some of the other horror movies that they had released and that I hadn't heard of before, and this was one of them. Um, so it stars Mia Farrow, who of course I'm familiar with from Rosemary's Baby, which came out only a few years before. This film came out in 1971. And basically she plays a character who is blind and she, I think she's staying with her family in like a country manor or something and she ends up being stalked by a killer. So pretty basic premise, but I really like that sort of sensory deprivation idea, like similar to how um, in the movie Hush, which came out I think a few years ago, uh, where the main character is deaf, but she's also being stalked by someone in her house. So it just sort of adds to the, the tension and just sort of the stakes as well. Like I can't imagine anything more terrifying than knowing someone is hunting for you but you cannot see anything, you're blind. So they're just a yeah, really freaky idea and I hope that it's executed quite well. Next up, we have the film, The New Centurions. So this film came out in 1972 and stars George C. Scott and Stacey Keach. And basically they have like a, it's a cop drama. They have a rookie cop, veteran cop sort of relationship where, you know, they become partners and George C. Scott sort of shows him the ropes on the streets. Even though this sort of had the ingredients to be a film that I would typically enjoy, I have to say that I wasn't very impressed with this one, unfortunately. It does have some interesting ideas and tries to provide like a commentary on a lot of, you know, social issues such as, um, you know, crime in low socioeconomic areas and like, 
the reputation of the police force and like sort of how they're perceived by the public and all those sort of things. But unfortunately, even though it tried to tackle a lot of these big ideas, it never, it never really felt like it went beyond the surface level. One thing that I did like about the film was that when Stacey Keach and George C. Scott weren't on patrol together, the film sort of alternated between their perspectives and sort of tried to give their characters a little bit more depth. But unfortunately, as I've already sort of hinted at, it just didn't really work, especially for Stacey Keach's character. The film tries to give Stacey Keach's character some emotional complexity by creating a conflict between his obligations and changing values as a new police officer with his family life at home. And I can see why they would try and do this. It would make him a more compelling character, but it just wasn't executed in a very believable manner. And so you don't really care so much when big events happen that affect his family and his sort of professional life. With those criticisms aside, I think this is still an okay movie that is decent to watch. I think I was just hoping for a little bit more from it. Next film we have here is Bunny Lake is Missing. So this is a black and white crime mystery from 1965 and it's basically about a woman who reports that her child is missing after going to pick her up from daycare and she's just nowhere to be found. And as the detective played by Laurence Olivier starts to investigate this disappearance, we start to notice a lot of peculiar things that make us wonder whether or not Bunny Lake was even a real person to begin with. Unsurprisingly, Laurence Olivier plays his role excellently in this. He brings a lot of charm to the role and I found him to be quite funny in a lot of the scenes that he was in. And this was just a really fun movie to watch. Sarah and I like had a lot of fun coming with a lot of high hypotheticals and you know we're trying to solve the mystery as we're watching the movie and we came up with all these crazy ideas of as to what may have actually happened and while the ending of this movie I we found it to be quite satisfactory I can see some people may be getting a little bit annoyed with like what choice they decided to go with regarding how the mystery sort of ties itself up although I will say the sort of direction they go feels very typical of a lot of horror movies in the 60s and 70s but I'll leave it at that because I don't want to spoil it so the next one we have is blue collar I got unlucky with this one and I didn't get a clear case. There seems to be a shortage with them with some of the companies. I think they're swapping over to the same type of cases that Criterion use. Um, but this is the only one that came with the blue case. And I guess in a way it's kind of fitting given that the movie is called Blue Collar. So this film stars Richard Pryor, Harvey Keitel, and Yafet Kota, whose name I apologize if I'm mispronouncing. But this one was also written and directed by Paul Schrader, who's obviously a massive name in the industry, and he's responsible for a lot of fantastic films that we love. So the film centers around these three characters who work at a car factory. And after sort of experiencing, you know, really harsh working conditions and for very little pay, um, they decide they've had enough and they're going to rob the local union who represents their company. But it's only when they go to uh, rob the union that they discover a lot of written materials that they can use to blackmail them instead. So aside from knowing that Paul Schrader was behind this, I wanted to watch this movie because Richard Pryor was in it. And, you know, I'm very aware of his legendary status as a stand-up comedian. I wanted to see what he was like in a film. And I think he did a really good job. He provided a lot of comedic relief in this movie, although... I think maybe it was just my lack of research. I thought that this movie was going to be a lot funnier than it was. Not that it wasn't, it didn't have its moments of comedy, but it feels very much more like a drama with a couple of comedic tidbits thrown in. So Blue Collar is actually quite similar to The China Syndrome in a few respects because they're both films that deal with very topical subject matter for the time that they came out in, which was of course the 70s. Blue Collar sort of examines the state of the union and like the role that they play within the workforce. And obviously, you know, unions were very topical during the 70s. And, you know, while they were established, you know, there was a room for a lot of corruption and people were still sort of trying to figure out how to take, you know, make use of the union and what role they actually played in ensuring a safer workplace and workers' rights and all that sort of stuff. So I found that to be very um, interesting in this movie. And I think Paul Schrader wrote that aspect of the film quite well. And even going beyond its commentary on unions in the workforce, this film has a lot to say about race relations and, you know, a lot of the struggles that minorities face in the country. And, you know, Richard Pryor, he's actually responsible for a lot of this information being communicated, you know, in the form of almost like monologues, I guess you could say. And they were delivered really, really spectacularly. And a lot of the content of what he was saying, and like in a lot of his dialogue, um, it really hit hard. And I find that it is quite relevant in today's contemporary society as well. So the film has definitely aged quite well, in my opinion. While I did find there to be some pacing issues in the middle of the film and a little bit towards the third act as well, overall I thought this was a really enjoyable movie that has a lot to say about class welfare and race relations that I think is still relevant in today's context. So this next film is called Experiment in Terror. And this one is one of the ones I definitely blind bought. I don't really know a whole lot about this movie. Like, I know it's been received well, and the plot, I think, from memory is based on this woman who gets, like, an obscene phone call, and basically the phone caller coerces her into, like, I think robbing a bank or something for him. Um, but, yeah, it's sort of like a... It's supposed to be, like, a horror thriller type of film, so... It was interesting to me in that regard, and, yeah, I don't really know much else about it but apart from that. So if you've seen this one, let me know what you think. Next up, we have the film The Passenger. This film is directed by... 
Oh, this is a hard name to say. Michelangelo Antonioni, <laughs> who is a very legendary director, although he is a director whose films I'm not super familiar with. I just know of his status. So the film follows Jack Nicholson's character, who plays a type of reporter who is supposed to be covering a war in this country. And I, f forgive me for not remembering the country that he initially starts off in, but he ends up going there and he can't find what he's looking for. So he ends up retreating back to the hotel. And he meets this guy there who unfortunately passes away. This is in the first sort of opening parts of the movie. And he decides then and there that he's going to take this man's identity and just sort of run amok and have a new life and leave his old life behind. But unbeknownst to him, he's taken on the identity of a arms dealer. This one seems to unfold in a very slow way as well. It wasn't what I was expecting given the sort of nature of the plot. You would expect a plot about a person who's taking on the identity of a dead arms dealer to be like really high action and have a lot of crazy stuff going on. But it's not necessarily the case with The Passenger. In The Passenger, it seems to be more of an exploration of identity and basically a trying to escape one's past. In my personal opinion, Antonioni, he used this arms dealer plot device as a vehicle to explore the fragility of Jack Nicholson's character and how he's basically saying that you can't move on and start a new life without reconciling yourself with your past. And I thought that whole concept was tackled brilliantly in this movie. After watching this film, I'm very keen on watching more of Antonioni's other works. And yeah, I just really enjoyed this movie. I thought it was a great exploration of identity. You know, Jack Nicholson was great. He's really cemented himself as one of my favorite actors of all time, I would have to say. And yeah, just an overall a really great viewing experience. I'm just realizing how many 70s movies I've actually been showing. It's pretty crazy. Um, here we have another 1973 film, and that is Charlie Varick. So the film is about some professional thieves who rob a local bank, and they end up making away with a lot more money than they were anticipating. And they soon come to the conclusion that this bank was likely a place for the mafia to store their dirty money. And so not only do they, will they have the cops after them, they're going to have the mafia after them as well. One thing about this that I found to be really interesting was that the film did not care at all about whether or not its main characters were sympathetic or not. In fact, they portray them to be rather unsympathetic. But even though that is the case, and normally, you know, it's good to have some sympathetic characters in your story, the story itself was so interesting and fun and enjoyable that you didn't really mind so much that the characters themselves weren't the best kind of people. Stylistically speaking, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Quentin Tarantino was directly influenced by this movie, especially in the character played by Joe Don Baker. Now, he's not the main character by any means, but he's the type of guy, I guess you could call him like a hitman, henchman kind of guy. He's the person who the mafia send out to retrieve the money by any means necessary. He's like a problem solver. And there's something about the way that he's written. I don't know if it's like his attitude is very comedic and zany, which is like really heavily contrasted with like the brutal actions that he is doing in the form of like murder and torture and all that sort of stuff. That sort of character dynamic I find to be quite prevalent in some of Quentin Tarantino's works. So I found that to be quite an interesting parallel between this movie and Tarantino's filmography. And I think that aspect is what has sold me on this movie as being one of my favorites of the ones that I've watched. You know, on a, just on the plot level, you know, it's not the most unique story idea. You know, it's just, you know, a couple of people rob a bank and they get hunted down by the mafia and the cops, like pretty standard sort of, you know, thievery movie. But it's the way that it's directed and like, you know, the cinematography, the way the characters are written, the dialogue itself, the unsympathetic characters, just sort of, all of this sort of culminates into a really what I feel is a unique viewing experience. So if you haven't checked out Charlie Varick, I do highly recommend it. I It definitely has a lot of rewatchability for me personally, and I feel like you might agree. So last of the standard releases before we move on to the limited editions, this is The Eyes of Laura Mars. So this is another 70s movie. This one came out in 1978, and it stars Faye Dunaway and Tommy Lee Jones. And I don't think I've ever seen Tommy Lee Jones in a movie as old as this. He looks so young in it. But basically, this is like, you could describe The Eyes of Laura Mars as being the American take on the giallo genre. Faye Dunaway plays a artist, sort of fashion icon type of character who begins to experience visions of people around her being murdered. And she very soon realizes that these murders are actually happening and she is seeing through the eyes of the killer. The murder plot whodunit aspect to this movie alongside the supernatural undertones, you know, in the form of the visions, really does like give me the feeling of that I'm watching a GLF film from Italy. And I found it to be really interesting to see an actual American production tackle the giallo form. This film definitely does have its limitations and I would totally understand it if you said that you really didn't like the ending of this movie. I will say though that 
with GLO films and the t type of murder mysteries that we often see explored in those films, the ending of this is very typical of that subgenre. And so while that doesn't might not necessarily excuse it for those people who aren't keen on GLO films, I personally don't mind endings like this because it's sort of what I've come to expect from a lot of GLO films. Some of the limitations of this movie, in my opinion, would be that I think Faye Dunaway's character arc just sort of went the wrong way. She started off as a very independent, strong woman in a position of power as, you know, this really iconic fashion designer or whatever. Um, but she very quickly fell into the woman in distress type of role, which I didn't really like. Um, the other thing as well was there is a romance subplot in this movie that just feels extremely rushed and unnatural. And I felt unnecessary as well. But yeah, apart from that, I think, you know, there are other things that I could critique in this movie. As a horror film, it might not be one that I would recommend most people prioritize. But I will say, though, that if you are a fan of GLO films, it might be one that's worth checking out just for like, you know, the cool sort of idea that it is an American production that is taking on a GLO form, if that makes sense. So I like the novelty aspect of it in that regard, but maybe not one that I would recommend to all horror fans. So we're about to move into the limited edition releases now. I'm going to start off with The Pillow Book. So again, as I mentioned, there are going to be a few that I haven't watched yet, and of course this one is one of those, given that it's still sealed. I picked this one because it's directed by Peter Greenaway, who I've talked about in a few other videos back. I really loved his film, um, The Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover. I always get that title mixed up, I believe that's the way you say it. But yeah, he's just a very interesting filmmaker, and I really like his aesthetic, at least based on that film that I've watched. And I am due to watch the other films of his that I've picked up recently as well. And I figured, you know, his name's attached to this. The idea of the plot sounded quite interesting to me as well. And, you know, Ewan McGregor's in it too. So if you have watched The Pillow Book, definitely let me know what you think. So the next movie we have here is The Front. And this one stars Woody Allen, although it isn't directed by him like a lot of his movies are. This one's directed by Martin Ritt. And basically, I haven't watched this one yet just because I'm waiting to watch it with my father, who is a big fan of Woody Allen films. And we've heard that this one is quite good, so pretty keen on watching this one. So the next one is another one that's still sealed, and that is The Wild One, starring Marlon Brando. And this film came out in 1953, and apart from just wanting to watch more Marlon Brando films, especially from this era, um, I've heard of this film's legacy as being, I think it's widely considered to be the first sort of outlaw biker movie. And I think the character that Martin, Marlon Brando plays, I can't remember his name, but I think he was a very sort of, that character became sort of like a well-known persona in the 1950s. This is just going off what I read really quickly when I was researching the film. But um, considering the film's legacy, the fact that it's starring Marlon Brando, it's got Lee Marvin in it as well. And just, yeah, knowing its reception in general, I'm very interested to watch this one, which is why, of course, I picked it up. So the next film I have to show here is The Border. So this movie came out in 1982 and it stars Jack Nicholson and Harvey Keitel and it was directed by Tony Richardson. And basically it's about Jack Nicholson's character who he moves with his wife from California to El Paso, Texas to become a border patrol agent. While his duties begin to be quite normal for a border patrol agent, he soon becomes privy to a lot of corruption within the border patrol agency and he faces a lot of internal and external pressure to participate in these corrupt activities as well. Jack Nicholson, as always, is a pleasure to watch on screen, as is Harvey Keitel. And Warren Oates is in this as well, who I'm, I just recently watched in Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, and he was good in this movie too. I think this is a decent crime drama, but I think I would have some of the same criticisms for this as I did for The New Centurions, which is that it does touch upon a couple of big ideas, but really sort of fails to dig into it on a more meaningful, deeper way. One of the bigger issues that this film does look at is the contrast between the perceived materialism of the United States and how this contrasts directly with the harsher living conditions and desperation of the Mexican people. And given that this is a big idea, the film does try and explore it on a minor level through Jack Nicholson's character arc, where we see the materialistic side of his life, where, you know, his wife and his social circle, they're very focused on money, um, keeping up appearances and maintaining social status. And this sort of conflicts with his new existence as a border patrol agent where he becomes increasingly exposed to the harsh realities of people who live literally just over the border. And this sort of juxtaposition between these two different types of existences um, is probably the most compelling part of the movie, even though it's not necessarily tackled the best way, in my opinion. I think the biggest missing ingredient for this film is the characters themselves. Jack Nicholson's portrayal is fine, but it's mostly the people around him. I find them to be pretty much caricatures, really. They're very one-dimensional, which has the unfortunate effect of lessening the impact of the film's sort of themes and messages that it's trying to convey. Had the film placed more emphasis on developing these characters around Jack Nicholson, I feel like we would have had a much more well-rounded film and it would have been a lot more successful in its deconstruction of both social and racial issues because it's otherwise very hit or miss in that department. At the end of the day, we had a decent, kind of enjoyable drama that could have been more than what it was. So this next film is To Sir With Love. 
And I'm very keen to check this one out uh, for a couple of reasons. So obviously I've heard so many good things about this. Um, it's got great reviews. It's supposed to be a classic. Uh, but the film is about a teacher who works in a low socioeconomic area and basically from my understanding he's placed into a very difficult classroom where he faces a lot of resistance from his students and it's about him trying to like win them over and give them a good education and i find that really interesting because i'm going into the teaching profession myself um, i've already been casual teaching for the last couple of months but yeah i'm just really interested to see how teaching itself is portrayed especially given that the movie came out in 1960 so it'd be cool to see what's evolved and what hasn't evolved from this time period. So very keen to watch this one. This next film is called Birdie. So this film stars Matthew Modine and Nicolas Cage, and it came out in 1984, so it's an early film in both of their filmographies, and I think they did an excellent job. Basically, it's about their characters who, they come back from the Vietnam War, and they're both very damaged from what they experience, especially Matthew Modine's character, who has had such psychological damage that he's convinced himself that he wants to become a literal bird. So this one was actually a first time watch for me and I was very surprised with how the story itself was structured because I remember when I was reading about the plot to decide whether or not it'd be something that interested me, I remember thinking that it was going to be much more of a linear structure where, you know, they'd get back from the war, they'd have their psychological trauma and then it, the movie would just sort of move forward from then. But rather than that, we get a much more fragmented structure where it alternate between the past and the present for the purposes of showing us how these two characters first met and how their relationship began to develop over a period of time. And I thought this is a really good filmmaking choice, especially in consideration of the nature of the plot, because um, seeing how their friendship developed over the course of the movie, even in this fragmented structure, made for a much more emotionally impactful third act and climax. And in saying that, I do want to stress that there aren't that many scenes of them in the actual war itself. A lot of the film takes place either um, before the war when they're sort of becoming friends or during the mental institution, which is after their conflicts. So if you're going into this expecting a war type of movie, it's not your traditional one in the sense that you see a lot of wartime conflict or you know, stuff like that. So just be wary of that going in. In saying that, I think this is a good movie that proves to be a very capable study of the two naive youths that Matthew Maiden and Nicolas Cage play, and I would definitely recommend it. And here we have the film Little Murders. I haven't watched this one yet. Uh, it was directed by Alan Arkin, which I found to be quite interesting because I'm more familiar with him as an actor, but it also stars Elliot Gould and Donald Sutherland. Um, Donald Sutherland, of course, is a fantastic actor, and I've been wanting to watch more of Elliot Gould's films, especially after really liking his role in the neo-noir film The Long Goodbye. I thought he was really good in that one, and of course, as with most of these films here, they've all had pretty good reception, so excited to watch this one. So full disclosure, these last two they're going to be showing, they're both box sets, but I'm yet to dig into them because I just haven't had the time to watch the movies yet, but I'm very excited to. Uh, the first one I'm going to be showing you here is John Ford at Columbia. Um, very gorgeous looking box set. I love the indicator uh, box sets. I always think they're really great quality and they always look amazing. Um, but yeah, this is John Ford at Columbia uh, from the films uh, between 1935 and 1958. And included you get The Whole Town's Talking, The Long Grey Lion, Gideon's Day, and The Last Hurrah. Now, I, I haven't actually seen John, many of John Ford's films before. I know he's supposed to be a very, very prolific uh, director, and I've heard so many actors praise his films. So I've been wanting to become more familiar with him, as I've said heaps, with a lot of these other directors. But same goes for John Ford, and you know I figured that this is a great way to get introduced to his films. Um, if you have any particular favorites from this box set, definitely let me know so I know which ones to prioritize. But of course, I'm going to end up watching all four of them, so can't wait. And this last box I'm going to be showing you today is the Marlene Dietrich and Joseph von Sternberg at Paramount 1930s to 1935. So these last two box sets have been sealed, but I'm going to open them up and film the stuff that's on the inside so you can get a look at the box sets themselves. Um, as I've already said, indicator box sets are fantastic. And I forgot to mention as well, these were both limited to 6,000. So the John Ford box set, I got number 1,559. And the Marlene Dietrich set, I've got 5,756. So almost missed out on the Marlene Dietrich set, it seems. But very glad to have this in the collection. It actually comes with, I think, six films. Yeah, so you get Morocco... Dishonored, Shanghai Express, Blonde Venus, The Scarlet Empress, and The Devil is a Woman. And in particular, I have seen this set been heralded as being one of their indicators' best releases ever. Everyone who shows off this release talks about how fantastic it is and how good all of these movies are. So I'm very excited in particular to watch these, especially because um, I've been wanting to watch more films from the 1930s as well. So on top of these being praised by both collectors and critics alike, I'm just happy to have an amazing looking edition like this in, in Sarah and I's collections. So yeah, very excited to dig into these and I'm sure I'm gonna, they're going to be great.
So that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching this indicator Blu-ray haul. Um, I was really excited to get these in the mail and I've been going through them at a really fast pace, but I still have plenty to catch up on, of course, as you've already seen from the video. So uh, let me know what you think of the haul. Um, tell me some recommendations for other films from Indicator's catalog that you think Sarah and I should check out. Uh, we think we have a pretty decent Indicator collection, but we still have a lot of missing gaps. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on Indicator as, the, as a label itself and you know what particular titles you think would be great for us to check out. So... Uh, thanks very much for watching. Um, if you liked the video, feel free to uh, subscribe and you know keep an eye out for future videos. Our next one should be an arrow haul from the previous Shocktober Christmas sale sort of thing. And yeah, it should be good. So thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.